Hello, and thank you for joining us today in our study of the book of Galatians. Today we're in Galatians chapter 4. Now, as you come into chapter 4, you're actually coming into the middle of a conversation. And so, if you've not already seen our video on chapter 3 that we did yesterday, I'd encourage you to click the link in the upper right-hand corner and go through and see the things that we discussed yesterday from chapter 3, because especially the end of chapter 3, where he talks about this idea that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, that's where this discussion starts in chapter 4. It's not a new discussion or even a new theme, it is actually just a continuation of the things that are said at the end of chapter 3. And so as Paul continues this discussion here in chapter 4, he's going to make several other comparisons. And you're going to see several things that he is going to say, but you're also going to see the level of concern that Paul has for the direction that they're taking their beliefs about who is supposed to be a Christian and what it is that has to be done to be right in the sight of God. And so let's look at what Paul says in this longest chapter of the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1, we read, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by, his, by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What, then, was your, the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. I have, there, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. 
Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Once again, there are a lot of things in this chapter to unpack. And we're not going to have time to go into enormous detail on any of them, but let me give you some highlights that may help in understanding the message of the Apostle Paul and give you some things to think about as you delve into it a little bit more fully on your own time. As you come into chapter 4, remember it follows on the heels of the statements of chapter 3 about us all being one in Christ Jesus and not being Jew or Greek or bond or free and so on and so forth. And as you come into chapter 4, he's going to make some comparisons here between the idea of being a son and being a slave or being a servant. And so you're going to have this discussion in the first few verses about the adoption of sons. And he's going to talk about it from the vantage point of those who are Jewish Christians. Because he says that as long as a, a child is a child, he is nothing more different than a slave. And what he means by that is he doesn't have the ability to make his own decisions. He doesn't have the ability to decide what it is he is going to do. There are guardians and there are stewards who make those decisions until the time appointed by the child's father. And so you have this idea of the Jews being children. They are ones that were under bondage to the law of Moses until such a time as Christ came and they grew up. The idea then is that when the fullness of time had come, when the right time had come, God sent forth his son, verse 4, Jesus. He sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, born during the days of the law of Moses, to redeem those, to bring them out from being under that law, that we might receive the adoption, he says, as sons, not as children who don't have anything to do or anything to say and no way to choose what it is they're going to do, but as sons. And because you are sons, he says, verse 6, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. He's continuing to build this narrative of the freedom and of the expectations of God in Christ and through Christ that the law did not have and did not accommodate. And so you have these statements, and he's going to talk about as you go deeper into the chapter, the fact that he's afraid that they're turning in the wrong direction, that they're listening to the wrong people, because he says in verse 17, these Judaizing teachers, as they're often called, these people who are trying to get them to go back to the Jewish principles and the Jewish practices are zealously courting you. They want you to be zealous for them and for their ideas and for their practices. But it's not the same thing as what Christ teaches. And it's not causing the same thing and bringing about the same responses as what Christ desires. And so then you're going to have at the end of the chapter this allegory, this this story that actually occurred back in the book of Genesis, but he's going to use it as a comparison. And it's interesting the way he does it because he almost flips it on its head uh, from what it was to what he's going to use it to be. Because the allegory is going to be about Sarah and Hagar. Now, Abraham was promised a son. 
he's going to have to wait 25 years for that son to be born, Isaac. But in the midst of that time, Sarah is going to give Hagar to Abraham that she might have a son through her because she doesn't have any children of her own. And so you have Hagar, who was a uh, female servant of Sarah. And then you have Sarah. From these two women are going to be two sons that are going to be born. One is Hagar's son, Ishmael, and the other is Sarah's son, Isaac. But the promise of God was not toward Ishmael. The promise of God was toward Isaac. And so the children of Israel, the children of uh, the descendants of Abraham through Isaac, look at themselves as the sons of Abraham. They consider themselves the children of Abraham, and such they are. But notice the way that Paul flips that dynamic, because he makes the statement that the Jews and their mentality in holding to the law of Moses is actually acting like the children of the bondwoman. He says in verse 24 that these things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage. That's the law of Moses. And he says this is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is where the law of Moses was given, in Arabia, which corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. They are under bondage within that law by holding themselves to that law. They have made themselves slaves to a law that no longer exists from the standpoint of its validity before God. Jesus took that law away and fulfilled it. Remember, that's the message back in chapter 3. And so the Jerusalem above, he says, though, the Jerusalem of the Christian, of the one who follows Christ, of the one who is the servant of Christ, the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all, and that is the comparison to Sarah. So, from the Jewish mindset, they are the children of Sarah and Abraham. But in the allegory, Paul is going to flip that around and say, but by the way you're living in holding to a law that is no longer valid, you're making yourselves the children of Hagar instead of the children of Sarah. Then he says in verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Thus you have the Jews saying to the Christians that if you're really going to be acceptable before God, you've got to be like us when they are binding themselves to something that Jesus took away. And so you have here in chapter 4 this continuing discussion of the differences between being under the old law and being under the new covenant that Christ came to put into practice. And how that those of the Galatians who are struggling with this area have to realize that God does not bind us to the things of the Old Testament law in the days of Christ and under the terms of Christianity. And so as you look at the things of Galatians 4, it's going to be a, a multi-layered giving of more explanation and some more comparisons for them to think about when it comes to understanding the nature of their relationship with God under Christ. Thank you so much for watching the video today, and I hope that these things have been beneficial to you. Next time we'll come back and we'll continue looking at what Paul has to say in Galatians chapter 5. And he's going to start moving into some other areas of reinforcing who they are as Christians. I hope that you'll join us then. 
But until then, have a great day.